Now to our second science understanding. Knowledge of the mole ratios of reactants can be used in quantitative calculations. We need to know how to perform stoichiometric calculations when given the reaction equation and the necessary data. And I want to tell you again that this was covered in stage one chemistry. You can see under these particular subtopics and topics, this is where we have essentially covered it. So if you do have any issues with this, I would recommend that you go back and have a look at some of the videos for subtopic 2.3, 4.3, and our work on acids and bases, in particular in relation to titrations. To do a bit of a recap here, I've summarized the process that you follow uh, using this diagram here. So this can essentially be used to solve for um, most, if not all, stoichiometric problems. Let's just say, for example, we are given the mass of um, various reactants and we are asked to work out the mass of a particular product that forms. So our starting point uh, is here. We have the mass of a known substance, so that's our reactant. What we then need to do is use this formula here, n equals little m over big M, to convert that mass into a number of moles. So we've got the number of moles of our known. We then use the balanced chemical equation and we look specifically at the mole ratio to then determine what the number of moles of our unknown, our product in this case, uh, would be. From there, we might need to then work out the mass of our product. So we go ahead and work out the mass by using the formula m equals n times big M. So you can do this for any range of reactants and products, whether they are given as masses, or perhaps more commonly if we're dealing with solutions, you may be given some information about the concentration and or the volume of them. So follow this uh, flow chart here to essentially help you solve for any stoichiometric problem. We're going to look at this in the event of uh, what we call excess and limiting reagents. When we are talking about excess and limiting reagents, we're talking about situations when too much or too little of one reagent is added, such that all reagents aren't used up in a chemical reaction. We have two particular terms we use. The excess reagent represents the reactant or reagent that is not completely used up, so there'll be some left over. And the limiting reagent is the one that completely is used up. And that means it will then also limit the number of moles or the amount of a product that forms. So in this situation, we're going to need to work out what our limiting and excess reagents are. From there, we can then only determine how much of a product may actually form. To do this, we can follow a range of steps. The first step is to calculate the number of moles of both reactants present. Second step is to calculate the mole ratio of reactants that we have mixed and then compare that to the mole ratio of reactants mixed with the reacting mole ratio which is based on the balanced chemical equation. From there we can then determine the excess and limiting reagents and then we can solve any other problems that are necessary. I have an example question here. So it reads 100 ml of a 0 0.10 molar copper sulfate solution is added to 50.0 ml of a 0 0.80 molar sodium hydroxide solution. It reacts according to the following equation which I've given you here. And you can expect um, in a test or an exam to be given a balanced chemical equation for these types of questions. I have two parts to my question. The first part is to determine which reactant is in excess and by how many moles. The second part is then to determine the mass of copper hydroxide, this product here, um, which is formed. So here's the question and the first part, we want to determine which reactant is in excess. So let's follow those four steps as we saw previously. Uh, number one, calculate the moles of both reactants present. So we've got 100 ml of 0.10 molar copper sulfate. That's one reactant reacting with 50.0 ml of 0 0.80 molar sodium hydroxide solution. There's the second reactant. We know in this case because we've got volume and concentration, 
we can use the formula N equals C times V. So starting off with copper sulfate, we have 0 0.10 multiplied by 0 0.1000. This gets us 0 0.010 mole. Uh, I've written that to two significant figures. Looking now at sodium hydroxide, again, N equals C times V. This is equal to 0 0.80 times 0 0.0500, and we get 0 0.040 moles, again, to two significant figures. Step two, we then need to calculate the mole of reactants that are mixed. So if we represent it in this form here, it's equal to 0 0.010 to 0 0.040, if we compare copper sulfate to sodium hydroxide. What we can then do is uh, simplify this so that we've got a whole number ratio present. And hopefully you can see that this simplifies to a ratio of 1 to 4 for copper sulfate to sodium hydroxide. The next step, compare with the reacting mole ratio. So looking at our balanced uh, chemical equation, we can see that the reacting ratio is 1 to 2. And from here, we should be able to work out what our excess and limiting reagents are. If we look here, we can see that we need a ratio of 1 to 2. So this says for every one lot of copper sulfate, we would need two lots of sodium hydroxide. Looking at the ratio of reactants mixed, for every one lot of copper sulfate, we actually have four times the amount of sodium hydroxide. So we have more than what's necessary, and that tells us that sodium hydroxide, therefore, is going to be in excess, and therefore copper sulfate will be our limiting reagent. So sodium hydroxide is excess, copper sulfate is the limiting reagent. The next part of this, however, is to work out how many moles the excess reagent is in excess by. So given that copper sulfate reacts completely, being the limiting reagent, we can then use mole ratios to work out how much of the sodium hydroxide reacts. So we can see unknown being the sodium hydroxide um, versus or against copper sulfate, which is the uh, known in this situation, has a ratio of 2 to 1. So the number of moles of sodium hydroxide that has actually reacted is 2 over 1 times the number of moles of our limiting reagent here. And so when we solve that, we get an answer of 0 0.020 moles. From there, we just need to do a simple subtraction um, to work out how much was actually in excess. So we had to begin with 0.040 moles, only 0.020 moles were actually reacted, and that leaves us with 0.020 moles in excess. For part B, we want to then determine the mass of copper hydroxide that is formed. So we know how much of the reactants do react now. What we're going to do is just start off with our limiting reagent. It's probably the easiest one to do. So using the moles of the limiting reagent, so that's given as 0 0.010 moles, we can use mole ratios to work out the number of moles of copper hydroxide that are going to be produced. We can see that there is a ratio of 1 to 1 of our unknown to known, so therefore we can just say that they are equal to one another. In order to work out the mass, we would need to know its molar mass. So the molar mass of copper hydroxide is 97.566 grams per mole. Please check that just to make sure. We can then use a rearrangement of the mole formula with mass to have the mass of copper hydroxide being equal to the number of moles multiplied by the molar mass, or n times big M. Substitute in our values there, and we should get an answer of 0.98 grams and you can see that I've rounded off to two significant figures there. This is our last science understanding, and what we'll find is that a lot of this is going to be covered in class because it is uh, going to rely on a lot of practical um, skills, and we're going to be working through this uh, by conducting a range of titrations. A titration can be used to determine the concentration of a solution of a reactant in a chemical reaction. Here are a few of our uh, requirements, so we need to be able to describe and explain the procedure involved in carrying out a titration. 
particularly rinsing glassware and determining the endpoint, and uh, determine the concentration of a solution of a reactant in a chemical reaction by using the results of a titration. So this component leads itself more to doing in class um, as prax. So that's where I'm going to lead most of our discussions. What we will consider though um, is some of the equipment that we need to work with. And from there, that'll act as a starting uh, point to looking at how we can then manipulate it uh, to conduct titrations as a form of volumetric analysis. So some of the techniques that you should already be familiar with, and again, I've linked this into the stage one course, are things such as the preparation of a standard solution. So this was back in subtopic 4.3. Uh, carry out dilutions, again, back in subtopic 4.3 and performing titrations, which we did cover in subtopic 5.2, which related to reactions of acids and bases. So the glassware that you should be familiar with using already are these here. We've got a volumetric flask, burette, and a volumetric pipette. So I'm going to introduce to you some of this glassware and their purpose and uh, what we might need to know in regards to their use. Starting off here, we've got a volumetric flask. We use it to accurately measure uh, volumes of solution and we often use it to uh, prepare standard solutions or to dilute uh, standard solutions to an appropriate concentration. We say that volumetric flasks have a particular uncertainty and this normally is around give or take 0.12 mils. So this is some level of uncertainty so that when we do measure up our specific volume. Um, for example, this is a 250 mil volumetric flask. We can prepare a, an accurate uh, standard solution of 250 mils, provided that we um, line up the bottom of our meniscus with this particular calibration mark here. However, if we do, the glassware has to account for some uncertainty. So even if the bottom of our meniscus sits exactly in line with that calibration mark there, it may have an inaccuracy of 0.12 mils. So it could be uh, lower by 0.12 mils or higher by 0.12 mils. Each piece of glassware will have its own degree of uncertainty and it does depend on the quality of the glassware. The next uh, piece of equipment is a burette. We say it has a resolution of 0.1 mil. So resolution refers to the smallest measurable increment by that piece of glassware or, or device or piece of equipment. So looking at our burette here, we can see that there are graduations or increments of 0.1. So going from zero to one here, but we have 10 smaller increments going from zero to one. Burettes uh, have a typical uncertainty of 0.03 mils, give or take. But again, it depends on the quality of the glassware. Um, the one in this image here we can see has an uncertainty of give or take 0.1 mil. So perhaps not um, of as high quality in this case. We often use burettes in titrations to deliver a volume of variable quantity and this variable quantity or volume we call our titer. Finally, uh, we have here a volumetric pet. So we use this to accurately measure a specific volume of solution. So it is a volume of fixed quantity, and this particular quantity is what we call our aliquot. Um, volumetric pipettes also have a typical uncertainty of about uh, give or take 0.03 mils again, depending on the quality of glassware here. Um, like volumetric flasks, volumetric pipettes also do have calibration marks. So I believe um, this one is up here. And so provided that we measure up our volume so that the bottom of the meniscus meets this calibration mark here, then we can say with quite a high certainty that we have, um, in this case, 10 mils of solution, but give or take that 0.03 mils, which isn't very much. Um, so hopefully you uh, have been uh, familiar with some of this glassware in the past. We are going to be looking at how we can use these in titrations. Like I said earlier, 
Um, this is something we're going to focus more in class um, in the form of, of practicals and look at how we can use this and how we can carry out titrations. So that's it for this um, video on 1.3. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.